did to Krillin. I swear, if it's the last thing I do... Jump, jump! Dragon Ball Z Budokai claimed the title of the greatest Dragon Ball game to ever release, essentially the moment it launched in 2002. To understand why this game was so significant, I need to set the table a bit. Before its release, there was a five-year gap between Dragon Ball games on a home console. That statement alone should provide some explanation to why so many were so happy that Budokai came to exist, but there's more to it than that. If you were a big fan of the show and lived in North America, the selection of games you had at your disposal with this license prior to the year 2002 was basically non-existent. Unless you acquired a Japanese or European version of certain consoles, you were stuck with two games, one on the NES and one on the PlayStation. However, even that isn't completely true. If you lived in North America, the Dragon Ball game on the NES isn't Dragon Ball, it's Dragon Power, an asset swap which changed everything that would make it obviously Dragon Ball into something else. Triangle cut sandwiches being the stand-in for panties. This makes more sense when you take into consideration that the first volume of the Dragon Ball manga had only come out the year prior, and the anime had only just begun airing in Japan. No one in America would have any idea what Dragon Ball was in the 80s. If we exclude Dragon Power, this means there was really only one North American Dragon Ball game, Dragon Ball GT Final Bout. I haven't played it myself, but it seems that it wasn't well received. All of this is why 2002 was such an incredible year for gamers that were fans of the show. First, it was the legacy of Goku for the Game Boy Advance, then Legendary Super Warriors for the Game Boy Color. Both were handheld RPG titles, one being more exploration-based and the other focusing on turn-based combat. As great or not great as those games were, they were both 2D, on tiny screens, and featured gameplay that wasn't exactly fast-paced or action-packed. Then the clouds parted and Dragon Ball Z Budokai descended down from the heavens. Not only was this in 3D, and not only did the characters genuinely look and sound like their TV show counterparts, you got to play through the major battles of the show, beginning from the Saiyan Saga all the way through the Cell games. Even though the story mode skips over quite a bit, it does give a brief snapshot of a few important moments in the series. For those of you who don't remember what it was like in the early 2000s, if you missed an episode of your favorite show on TV, you were shit out of luck. Streaming services weren't a thing, recording live TV wasn't a thing unless you were smart with your VCR, and official VHS tapes weren't accessible or cheap, especially if you were 10 years old. This abridged retelling of the Dragon Ball Z story genuinely may have provided some naive kid out there some context to what happened in the overall narrative. What's better, it would have looked close enough to the style of the show, more than any other game at that time, to fill in those gaps with a serviceable look-alike. My point is, there was nothing else like this. No other game came close to this level of presentation, and the gameplay was as close as you were getting to battles that looked like what took place on the show. All of this is why Budokai was easily the best game with the Dragon Ball license when it came out. The question is, how good is it really? Nearly 20 years later, after so many sequels and other games with this license, does the first Budokai hold up? Well, that's why I'm here, to smack you in the face with nostalgia and to complain and gush about a game that most people won't ever play again. First things first, the visuals obviously don't look as impressive as they did back in 2002. The models look a bit stiff and under-detailed, but of course, at the time, this was the closest any game came to looking like the anime. I don't think it's worth discussing how well they hold up to today's standards, so I'll move on. My favorite part about the visuals are how the menus and other out-of-gameplay screens look. There was so much care given to make everything in this game look and feel like Dragon Ball. Before even getting to the main menu, a dragon radar rolls in with Oolong and Puar waiting for the player to choose which memory card to save with. The loading screens have a Dragon Radar visual on the bottom right as well, which you can fiddle around with using the control stick. The main menu could have been a generic list, but instead it's a rotating wheel of Dragon Balls. The unique art for each selection on the wheel makes it all the sweeter. It is a shame that there are only six selections though, since there are normally seven Dragon Balls, but it's not a big deal. In the tournament mode, the brackets are presented on a scroll, and every character has a tiny sticker with what appears to be art made strictly for this game alone. 
All of these little details and touches to the non-gameplay menus and screens really tie everything together, and considering how often you'll be in these menus and screens, it's the least they could do. I'll touch more on that later, but for now, let's move on to the actual gameplay. It should be no surprise that Dragon Ball Z Budokai isn't a standout fighting game. Not only are you never going to see it being played competitively, most wouldn't think to utter this game's name in the same breath as Street Fighter or Tekken. There's just not a lot of depth here. That's not to say there aren't strategies you can learn to become better at the game, either fighting computer players or your inexperienced friends, but it should be pretty clear that this wasn't meant to push the boundaries of the genre. The four face buttons on the controller are punch, kick, guard, and key blast. Chaining successive punches and kicks together can stunlock the opponent, and depending on the character and loadout, you'll be able to end a few combos with a powerful physical or energy attack. Unfortunately, most of the moves in the game aren't character specific. Many of the fighters share a handful of the same combos and special moves, but with a different name and color, many of which even having the same input on the controller. Given the nature of Dragon Ball Z, in a way, this kind of makes sense. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad Dodoria is in the game, but what on earth are you gonna give this guy? May as well give him the same combo attack as everybody else and call it the Dodoria Beam, sure. To be fair, this mouth laser beam is the only thing I can remember him doing in the anime anyway, which makes it much better than a few of the other common attacks. You'll likely see a few punch kick specials that don't look that interesting, yet get some ridiculous grandiose name. I mean, really, a punch, a knee, and a kick needs to be called a Frieza Nightmare? Cell has one too, and his is called Ultimate Attack? Unfortunately, those aren't even the worst of it. Everyone who knows Dragon Ball Z knows what the Kamehameha wave is. It's not exactly a wave in this game, instead a melee attack with a visual flair, but even still, it's decent enough. When you think of a continuous form of a Kamehameha, I highly doubt you think of Goku just firing random key blasts. So many other characters have this move, and the names just astound me. Meteor Flash? Parmesan Shower? Killer Ball? Negative Power Rain? What is this? It's pretty ridiculous, and probably the worst aspect of the entire game in terms of accuracy. When talking about the combos again, if you're familiar with traditional fighting games, you may be pretty underwhelmed. There aren't any successive move inputs before a kick or a punch that generate a special move like Mortal Kombat or anything. You can only modify a punch or kick with up, down, forward, and back. The combos that end with a special move are even more limited. Most of the punches and kicks required in a chain are neutral, and only every now and then do they ask the player to hold forward or backward on the D-pad or control stick. This means if you aren't up to learning all the characters' combos by heart, you can basically mash buttons and figure out the majority of them without much trouble. The only ones that I consistently had to look up were Piccolo's ultimate attacks, since they featured a back modifier on a few kicks or punches. In addition to all of that, there isn't any crouching, which means your normal guard can block any attack that isn't a grab, regardless of where it would land on the body. This is sort of what I mean by this game not having a lot of depth. For what it's worth, I don't think that's a negative, and if anything, the first Budokai game being so welcoming to inexperienced fighting game fans may have benefited them in the long run. I kind of see Budokai in the same light as Mario Kart. Mario Kart was a lot of people's first foray into the racing genre, which may have sparked an interest which developed over time, eventually feeding into more hardcore racing games. No one realistically should complain that Mario Kart is too casual, since it's obvious going in. Where Mario Kart would have taught some of the basics of racing, like staying on the course, taking tight turns, or even drifting, Budokai may teach newbies to chain certain moves together, guard incoming attacks, and proper spacing. It's overall a nice starting point, and with this license, it probably got quite a few kids to put more time and effort into a fighting game than they ever had before. Even though I've kind of been talking down to Budokai, there are a couple of unique mechanics in this game that blend well with Dragon Ball Z. Key blasts, powering up your energy, transformations, flight, and the burst battles. Powering up your energy and key blasts basically go hand in hand. Key blasts are almost worthless in any capacity outside disrupting a player from far away as they try to charge up their energy. You can guard the blast easily, or even deflect it back at them, but it definitely seems like the point of the blast isn't to be an effective way to deal damage, just interrupting the other player as they charge up. The transformations themselves impact gameplay more than I had initially anticipated. Not only are you stronger with each additional level of transformation, certain attacks can only be pulled off when at various transformation stages. 
For example, the Spirit Bomb can't be activated if Goku is Super Saiyan. It requires him to be in one of the King Kai Fist forms. Most of the transformations require three key gauges to activate, however they can go as low as two and as high as five. It constantly drains your energy while active, and when under the required amount of key gauges, if you're knocked down, you'll return to a lower form. I initially got kind of annoyed with this system, since I just wanted to pretend to fight as Super Saiyan 2 Gohan forever without worry. However, given that it's a constant buff, there has to be some downside to mismanaging your energy. If you're good at the game, getting knocked down is something you won't see very often anyway, since you can press the guard button at the right time after an attack and return to normal stance immediately. The flight in this game is pretty irritating. You don't really have any control over your height, you just float up to your opponent if they're in the air, and float down if they're on the ground. The movement when in the air and on the ground feel pretty similar, which may explain why the movement in general feels pretty ass for the most part. Your options are either moving through wet cement or speeding at your opponent at breakneck speed. There is a hop forwards and backwards, but that seems more suited to dodging grabs and attacks since it closes a pretty big gap. Considering how fast you can move, the fact that charging attacks break the opponent's guard, and dashing automatically deflects incoming key blasts, it definitely seems like the designers wanted a faster-paced, offensive-focused game. Finally, there's the burst zone, where if both characters hit a charge strike at the same time, they battle it out like on the show, in a haphazard mess of punches and kicks. This is essentially a mini-game, where you'll need to twirl the analog stick a lot to win this tug-of-war match. I do think it's pretty cool, and I bet the kid version of myself loved it even more. I don't think it adds much to the gameplay, however, because I knew I could always win these burst zone duels, I sometimes would intentionally try to perform a charged attack when I knew the opponent was going to as well. Before moving on from the general gameplay side of things, there's one more unique quality to Budokai, but this one doesn't have anything to do with the Dragon Ball license, guard cancelling. Essentially, you can chain two combos together where you otherwise shouldn't be able to. Normally after a combo, the opponent has a chance to block the next attack, move away, or perform an attack of their own. There are a few combos that end in a punch or a kick that can be charged up if you hold the button down. If you press guard the moment that attack begins charging, however, you'll be allowed to attack or move immediately while the enemy is still stunned. For example, with Goku's, you can do a four kick combo, then on the last kick, guard cancel and swivel around the enemy and lead into another damage dealing combo. I'd say this definitely raises the skill ceiling, however, I also think it's a fairly cheesy tactic that, once you get it down, isn't that hard to pull off. During single player modes, I think it's fine, but I could see this being incredibly annoying in competitive matches, as the only thing that would prevent it is blocking or avoiding that very first kick. I do think it's interesting that the combos that can be guard cancelled aren't the same for every character, so it does vary up the roster a bit. I would imagine this was an unintentional side effect, however, because, as it is now, Goku is essentially the best character in the game without question. He already has more transformations than any other character, which boosts his attack power, but he also has two guard cancels that can chain together, meaning you can get three combos in a row without much of a problem. One of Budokai's strangest qualities has to be the capsule system. The characters in the game don't automatically have all of their unique moves, powers, and transformations with them. Instead, you have access to the capsules you've unlocked, and will then need to assign them to that character's tray. Every tray has seven slots, and the majority of the capsules take up one slot. Capsules can range from energy attacks and transformations, physical combo skills, and a whole host of general buffs that a lot of characters can use. All of this means you essentially don't have access to a fighter's full moveset unless you spend a lot of time with the game. There are a lot of reasons why I don't think this system is very good, but I do have to point out how much fun this could be for players who are already going to spend a lot of time with the game and have a love for collecting and trading. As a kid, if you had received a fresh PS2 with Budokai as one of your only games, my goodness, I could easily see how this would be such a fun time. That being said, as an adult that doesn't want to spend loads of time grinding in tournament mode, this system is very irritating. You can unlock capsules via story mode and by buying them at Mr. Popo's shop. Playing every story mode mission once through will only get you a few character-specific capsules, mostly for Goku and a few for Vegeta, Piccolo, and Gohan. This means after the story mode is finished, you'll essentially have zero capsules for the likes of Trunks or Zarbon or even Android 19, and really, being deprived of a fully-fledged Android 19 is enough to make a kid cry. 
You can play through the story missions again, but you'll only get one more capsule after every battle, and it seems completely randomized, meaning you could easily get ones you already have. Even though the tutorial message about the capsules doesn't make this clear, the shop is the de facto method of acquiring all of the capsules, and the only way to get money is by playing tournament mode. I'll talk about tournament mode in more detail in a minute, but what's necessary to know right now is that you can only get money by being the runner-up or winning the whole thing. Playing on harder variants of tournament mode nets you a lot more cash, but because there are more battles on the higher difficulties, it's more of a risk, as like I said, you don't get any money if you don't come in first or second place. I think that's very aggravating, as the out-of-bounds nonsense could spell disaster for any slight slip-up, and with how often your eyes will be glazing over while grinding tournament mode for more money, it happens more often than you might expect. A small improvement to the whole experience for me would have been to grant a small amount of money to the player every match, ensuring that it isn't all or nothing. Or you could give out a random capsule every battle one as well. Or give out money for missions completed in the story mode. All of those suggestions would have merely been band-aid solutions, however, as the shop itself has some serious issues. You have five selections, but four of the five are a gamble. The red, blue, and green 2000 selections give out a random capsule of that color. The gamble, which costs more, could literally be anything, and Popo's recommendations can vary in price and capsule type. I'm assuming the only reason the gamble option exists is the rarity factor. The capsules come in four tiers of rarity, which apparently impacts how effective they are, I guess. Annoyingly, there's no hard numbers in-game that say how much better a rare version of a capsule is, and there's also no telling how much more likely you are to get something with a rarer grade with the gamble. And considering that it costs more than the other selections, it's a tough sell, to be quite honest. Unless you're like me, who ignored all of the red flags and gambled away my money anyway. I mean, I know I really wanted the Super Saiyan Trunks capsule, which would normally mean I would go with the red capsule selection, but... Well, a red capsule is a red capsule, but the gamble could be anything. It could even be a red capsule. So I would go with the gamble and sometimes get garbage. The only selection which shows you what you're buying is the recommendation from Mr. Popo. In the beginning, it will almost always be something you don't have, but after a while, it will be more shit you don't care about. Don't worry, there's a way to waste time here as well, since you can back out and his recommendation changes, meaning you can actually choose to buy exactly what you want, However, it may take you a dozen or more triangle and X button presses to get the job done. Since it's now clear you can manipulate the system to get what you want anyway, it should now be apparent that the randomized selections for red, blue, and green capsules is a terrible idea. I can definitely see what they were going for with all of this. Replace the capsules with trading cards or Pokemon and it becomes clear as day. This combination of rarity, gambling, collecting, and trading was probably a winning one for a certain demographic of players out there. What's better is these capsules actually influence the movesets of your favorite Dragon Ball Z characters, such as Android 19 and Dodoria. For me, it's tough. On one hand, I do love unlocking things. I've said in my Battlefront video that even though I wouldn't use the reward it gave me, chasing those hut contracts and unlocking everything was satisfying. There's a completionist aspect to it, like you're slowly completing the game, even though you really aren't. There is a surge of that good dopamine when you gamble and get a rare or new capsule. However, that isn't real. I'm not unlocking more content to play. I'm finishing a checklist. I don't want this to spiral into semantics, but I'd argue grinding tournament mode to unlock capsules for characters that you or no one else cares about isn't a good use of anybody's time. You could argue that same thing could be said for video games in general. However, that seems like a bad faith argument to me, and one that I'd ignore, as why the fuck else would you be 20 minutes deep into a video game review? Given that the vast majority of real gameplay when you're grinding is spent playing sumo wrestling with Dragon Ball characters, it's not like you'd be missing out on much if you decided to ignore all of this nonsense. For a game like this, there's really no hard line in the sand for when you've officially completed it, but I'd say, if you had your fun with it, played through the story missions, played as Hercule for a while, and unlocked the secret characters, you can pat yourself on the back and not bother with the grinding for capsules. Or god forbid, the Dragon Balls. Instead of capsules, sometimes you'll come across Dragon Balls, and if you collect all seven of them, you get to ask Shenron for anything, even triangle cut sandwiches. Well, no, not really.
you get to unlock a breakthrough for a character, which allows you to equip all of their capsules or something. It's essentially the workaround to the seven capsule limit. I didn't do it, as a good friend of mine told me not to waste my time grinding for Dragon Balls, as, yes, acquiring Dragon Balls is as grindy as everything else, if not more. You only get one wish per seven, and there are 23 characters. If you're sadistic enough, you could see the game not being fully completed until you got all of the breakthroughs. For the love of god, please don't take that as a challenge. The last thing I want to mention about the capsules is how repetitive and redundant so many of them are. I totally understand needing to unlock the spirit bomb for Goku, or the burning attack for Trunks, special beam cannon for Piccolo, and so on. I get it. That's their move. However, Making the generic grabs and physical skills into a character-specific capsule just feels like an attempt to pad out the number of capsules in the game. Given that about a third of the characters on the roster can perform the Kamehameha wave, that's seven different capsules to unlock. It's not satisfying at all to gamble your money only to unlock a Kamehameha wave for Krillin or fucking Yamcha. Some of the support capsules are beyond ridiculous as well. There are quite a few armors that literally just offer some defense or guard effectiveness, and not only is it not explicit in how much better each one is, all you have to go on is how many slots it takes up. This bloats the total number of capsules to an absurd level. It all feels so pointless when you analyze it as closely as I have in this video, and it is. It's a pointless exercise in time wasting. Just think the sequel to this game would release only a year later, and I'd imagine most dedicated Dragon Ball Z fans moved on to that one as it was a general improvement. Imagine all that time spent playing sumo wrestling in tournament mode for capsules. Oh man. Well, for anyone out there that did that, I hope you had a good time, sincerely. I do like tournament mode, but that mostly has to do with its presentation. The announcer from the show is here, and his voiceover work is stellar. You can tell they didn't half-ass it, as he has two different voice lines for every character introduction. One for if they're the first combatant, and one for if they're the second, as that one would have a lower intonation. Android 17 versus... Piccolo! Raccoon versus... Android 17! I'm also so happy that when you select Kid Gohan or Teen Gohan, that he leaves out the age and just says Gohan. Versus... Gohan! The artwork is something I've already praised, but I'll say it again. The stickers for each character are just so nice to look at. Besides the payouts being pretty harsh like I've already talked about, the only issue I have with tournament mode is that ring out is a thing. There's two main problems with this. The first is if you try your hardest to play the game normally by defeating your opponent like any other battle. You need to stay vigilant on how close you are to the edge, and if you're in a bad spot, you will then have to stop everything you're doing and make sure you move correctly on the Z-axis to get to a better position. Of course, you could easily get knocked out randomly if you flubbed a block or a dodge. This ties into the payout issue I mentioned earlier. Getting to the semi-final only to get booty slapped out of the ring in mere moments is just a frustrating experience. The second problem is tied to when you succumb to the sumo wrestler inside of you. Yes, it is pretty easy, and seemingly the most efficient way to win a match, but charging at the enemy over and over, or baiting them near the edge for a knockback attack is just so monotonous. The enemy AI is definitely trying to win the old-fashioned way, and it just feels dirty that I can swat them out with a single attack even though they had three times my health. What's the point? All of this being said, to play devil's advocate like I always do, I could easily envision a parallel version of myself doing a review on this game, also published on December 22nd of 2021, hopefully. And in that universe, I may have complained that you couldn't win or lose via ring out. Like, yeah, they could have programmed it so the edge of the ring was an invisible wall, but I guarantee I would have mentioned that not being able to win via ring out is lame, since it has happened in the show. However, this is the version of the game we have now, and sumo wrestling as the best method of victory in the tournament mode is not ideal. The story mode, for it being just a retelling of the DBZ story, is pretty decent, if not a bit rushed. I know a lot of people out there joke about how the original anime drags on for too long, some episodes consisting entirely of characters screaming for hours and such like that. I strongly disagree, I actually think the pacing of the show, besides certain sections of the Frieza and Great Saiyaman saga, is great, and this game offers a peek at what the other end of the pacing spectrum would look like. 
Everyone remembers Gohan turning Super Saiyan 2 as this big epic moment. Well, here's what it's reduced to in Budokai. You factory recall. <laughs> Yeah, so for everyone out there, you be thankful for what you have. Alright, I'll get off my soapbox now. Even though all of the story missions in a vacuum are fine, I'm not sure if I like how the content is spread out. If you're familiar with the events of the show or manga, you may be pretty confused on a first playthrough on why they left so much out. They kind of skip over the Ginyu Force introduction, they don't mention Zarbon or Dodoria even though they're playable characters, they didn't include a battle with Trunks and Frieza, they skip from the Android 19 Goku fight all the way to Piccolo fighting Cell and Android 17, then it skips to Goku and Gohan fighting Cell to finish it off. It all seems so odd until you realize that you can go back to the story mode and play missions that you, for some reason, weren't allowed to play yet. There are some missions that act as what-if stories that have you playing as the villain for a different outcome, but those aren't really what I'm talking about. On the second time through in the Saiyan Saga, you play as Piccolo against Raditz, the Cybermen, and Nappa. In the Namek Saga, you play as Vegeta against Zarbon, Raccoon, and Frieza. No Dodoria for some reason still, however they do finally show the full introduction of the Ginyu Force, and it's spectacular. Ginyu. In the Android Saga, you finally play as Vegeta against Android 19, then Android 18, then finally Imperfect Cell to finish it out. Still no battle with Trunks for some reason. It's very bizarre that you don't play as Trunks at all, even though he definitely fought against Frieza and Cell, and it's also kind of odd that you don't fight Dodoria either. Ignoring those few quibbles about the overall story, it being split into two chunks is a weird decision. I understand locking the what-if missions away, but how it's presented now doesn't really flow well together at all. I could understand it being a strictly Goku and Gohan story, then strictly a Piccolo and Vegeta story, but you do play as Piccolo the first time through. I almost wonder if the Goku, Gohan, and Piccolo, Vegeta split was what they had originally, but the gap between Android 19 and Cell was just too big, so they added the Piccolo fights in anyway. I'm not totally sure. They also completely skipped over Hercule and his heroics against Cell, which is inexcusable. Mr. Satan is Earth's greatest warrior, and him being shafted is a travesty. Anyway, like I said, there are a few What If missions, and they're pretty good. What if Vegeta won in the Saiyan Saga? Well, apparently he would ask Yajirobe to join him, get rejected, then fondly think of his deceased lover Nappa, which then turns him Super Saiyan. You know, what everybody figured would happen if he won. Frieza probably has the most boring one. He loses a tooth, asks Purunga for eternal life, then goes to destroy Earth. Eh, not as interesting as peering into Vegeta's secret love fantasy for Nappa. The Cell one is much better, and is probably what most people remember the story mode for. Krillin gets in the way of 18, and Cell absorbs Krillin instead, turning Cell into a tiny orange guy. You then destroy Yamcha, because of course you do. Give me a break! You can't teach Yamcha to fight me all by himself! It's just not fair! And then Tien kills Cell with a tri-beam. However, it was all just a nightmare. I think it's pretty great that even in Cell's dreams, he remembers the time where Tien threw tri-beam after tri-beam at him. Poor guy must have PTSD. Finally, the decision to end the story at Cell Games instead of continuing on to the Boo Saga when I was a kid really annoyed me. It makes perfect sense now, however, for a lot of reasons. The English dubbed episodes at the end of 2002 were in the middle of the Boo Saga, so spoiling it for the kids out there would have been kind of cruel, I think. It also saves something for the sequel if this game was successful. In a more pragmatic sense, the biggest issue would have been the amount of work needed to add in everyone from the Boo Saga. I have no doubt adding in Majin Buu, Super Buu, Kid Buu, Goten, Kid Trunks, Gotenks, and possibly even models for Deborah, Babidi, Videl, Spopovich, Supreme Kai, and the list goes on, would have taken a lot of work. There are just so many characters that get introduced that would have had to have been included in some fashion, and with how stretched the designers already were for making everybody's moves correct and varied, 
That would have been a very tall order, and would have surely pushed the release date back quite a bit. All of this is why, to me, ending at Cell Games is fine. Who knows, would we even get Dodoria or Zarbon if they had to focus on Boo and Gotenks? I highly doubt it, and a world where I can't use the Dodoria beam is a world I don't want to live in. Speaking of the characters, the roster is pretty impressive. It would have been nice to see Chaozu, Yajirobe, Android 20, the rest of the Ginyu Force, and possibly even Master Roshi, but honestly, they included so many fighters. Like, really, would anyone care if you couldn't play Android 19? If you couldn't play a Zarbon? Or Yamcha? I know I wouldn't. Fuck Yamcha! In all seriousness... Okay, no, seriously, fuck Yamcha. But it is cool that these characters got the nod. What's even cooler are some of the ultimate moves they have. Even though most of their attacks are fairly generic, there are quite a few special moves that are pretty unique. Even though it doesn't look as good as it really should, Android 19's energy drain attack is cool, and it gives him health back. I can't believe they got the Captain Genyu change bodies attack to work in this game. The health stays the same as well, meaning if you played terribly on purpose and changed bodies, you would then have the upper hand. Incredible. The best attacks in the game, and it's not even close, belong to a character that I've been being coy about. If you complete tournament mode on Adept Difficulty, you can then purchase Hercule, Mr. Satan himself, in Popo's shop. He is the fucking coolest character. He has a jetpack on so he can fly around like everybody else, he lacks key blasts because they're fake as hell anyway, but he has sweet kicks instead, He's OP as all hell in tournament mode, as his patented dynamite kick is the ultimate sumo wrestling move, and even better, his moveset is hilarious. He has an attack where he gets thwapped by the opponent, only to land on their head to deal damage. Best of all, his ultimate move is one where he hands the opponent a handheld video game explosive device. Oh man, I, I just I just love this guy. Last but not least, Great Saiyan Man is in the game as the final unlockable character. I think it's hilarious that he, of all people, was included as the secret Boo Saga fighter. His victory pose is, of course, great. And when he's announced, it isn't just Gohan, it's the Great Saiyan Man moniker. Great Saiyan Man versus Great Saiyan Man! Good stuff. You unlock him by completing tournament mode on advanced difficulty, which is a breeze given how fucking overpowered Mr. Satan is. He's so overpowered, he reached into the game files and extracted the seventh Dragon Ball on the main menu, turning it into his own game mode. Yes, Hercule gets his own selection on the menu. This is where the real story of the Cell games takes place. Hercule, all by his lonesome, takes on every Z fighter on the roster, some Cell juniors, and then, finally, Cell, saving the day like everybody predicted. Really, who else was gonna save the Earth? Some blonde boy band dudes? Heck no, it's Mr. Satan! This is apparently a very difficult game mode, as you have to do it all in one go without checkpoints. I apparently got very lucky, as I got it first try. I think Hercule may just be my best character. Unfortunately, you don't get anything out of it, which kind of sucks. I think you should definitely get some money by completing it at the very least. Thankfully, Hercule's voice lines between the battles are more than enough to make it a worthwhile experience. That was a whip! Huh. You two sick bald turkeys! I'll deal with you both at once! Jeez, he's got three eyes! What shape are his glasses? Ending this video with the dialogue of Mr. Satan himself seems fitting, as that, above all else, is what makes this game as great as it is. It's Dragon Ball every step of the way. Yes, there are some moves that don't have the right names or don't make sense with certain characters, but beyond that, every inch of this game is exactly what you'd expect and more. The story mode tells an abridged version of events to catch any newcomers up to speed while also having some fun with the what-if missions. Although the tournament mode can sometimes devolve into a King of the Hill style battle to stay in the ring, being able to pit all of these different fighters against each other in the first place, in an official tournament with all the pizzazz and presentation that you may expect, is really fun. Even though the capsule system irritated me, keeping it in line with the Dragon Ball universe with the Capsule Corp theme, even Dr. Brief rummaging through trays while you assign capsules to the fighters is a really nice touch. Having Hercule and the Great Saiyan be unlockable characters, one of which literally unlocking more content, including a whole host of fantastic dialogue from the original English voice actor, is a really fun surprise. 
Even though I don't think this is or ever was a very good competitive fighting game, it's still a good Dragon Ball Z game, and really, in the end, that's all that matters. Before the usual outro, I'd like to recommend one more channel to you all, Table53. If you have any interest in indie games, this is the channel to subscribe to. Not only will you get quality size reviews on recently released indie titles you may or may not have heard of, you'll get some fantastic insight as well. My favorite video from Table53 is his third video, comparing Into the Breach and FTL. There's some really great takes here, I'd highly recommend checking it out. I'm also forever thankful he made a video on many motorways, as I had somehow completely missed when that game released and probably wouldn't have played it otherwise. Go subscribe to him if you like what you see. Thanks everyone for watching, and thanks to my Patreon supporters, some of which will be scrolling by right about now. If I've managed my workload correctly, this will be the fourth video in four weeks, the end of this godforsaken experiment. I wanted to see what YouTube would do with my channel if I pretended I was someone who produced content every week. I think me taking three months off to accomplish this didn't help the situation, but it is what it is. I wanted this video to be a Star Wars video, I really did, but after Bounty Hunter, I apparently just didn't have it in me. I won't say which two Star Wars games I tried and didn't like, as who knows, maybe I'll end up reviewing them at some point. My brief break from Star Wars will be short-lived, however, as I will now return to Hibernation and finally get that fucking Battlefront 2 video done. I'm hoping I can get that out before Elden Ring launches. Let me know if Elden Ring is something you'd be interested in me covering. As of right now, I am leaning towards doing it, but I know how much of a time commitment that would be, and I know how saturated the market will be with Elden Ring videos in March and April. Let me know what you think. Okay, that's it for me. Join the Patreon if you want to support me financially. Like, comment, and subscribe, share the video, and yada yada. See you next time. Have a good one.